Welcome to this video on writing an annotated bibliography for a literature review. My name is Cecile Bardenhorst and I work in the post-secondary program in the Faculty of Education at Memorial University. What I want to do in this video is go through what an annotated bibliography is and why it's important for a literature review, how to do one and then why should you do one, why, why should you care about this. Why should you waste your time doing this? So what is an annotated bibliography? Well, a literature review is an extremely complex paper to write or, or chapter to write because you are involved in higher order thinking skills and a lot of cognitive complexity as you are not only reading the source text, but then you have to pull together all sorts of complicated things and rework them into a linear new piece of writing. So it's a very complicated process. And the annotated bibliography provides a way of managing this process, of making it more manageable. So it's a breathing space for you to gather your thoughts before working on the writing of the paper. In the annotated bibliography, this is where you work out the relevance and the quality of your sources. This is where you move from summarizing and understanding to analyzing and synthesis. So these are the three components, the full reference, the notes from the source text, and this would be your summaries, and then the interpretive or evaluative comments, and this is what you think about the paper. A source text is the document that you're reading. It's the journal article or the chapter. So how do you write an annotated bibliography? Well, it has quite a specific format, and the format has been developed because it makes it easier to work with. It's easy to see entries and it's easier to scroll through. But you can, of course, tailor make it to your needs. Um, and this is where you'll add in what you think you need from the source text for your paper. So let's look. The first component is listing the full reference of the citation in the required citation style. In education, we use APA and the most current um, of that is um, APA 7th. So you would list the reference in that formatting style. The reference would be in hanging indent. So the top line is indented, but the ones below that aren't. And the reason why we do this is because it makes it so much easier to read a whole list of these entries. It is also extremely useful, you know, if you're not a person who uses a citations um, software, you know, to have all your references already set up and written out, you can just collate them once you've finished your paper. So this is the formatting for these entries. Um, you have the citation and then in hanging indent the notes, which would be summaries of the source text and then interpretive and evaluative comments. And you would have a number of these. So it would look like this. So the second component are the summaries or your notes, the information that you've taken from the source documents. So in this section, it, um, you really want to highlight whatever, you, you want to put in what you want to take from that source text. So whatever you think is important, a summary of the entire paper, um, perhaps they have important bits in, the, in their literature review, you can note that, but it's really your, um, your, your, what you're taking from that source text and not your interpretation at this point. So most research papers follow this structure where you have an introduction, literature review, methodology, results, discussions, and conclusions. And there's usually an abstract at the beginning. Now, not all papers will follow this format and they might have different headings for the sections, but generally these are the components. And if you can write a sentence or two or maybe a bit more about each of these sections, that will give you an overview summary. Now, sometimes, but not all the time, the abstract will provide you with an overview summary. And maybe what you can do is begin with the abstract and add to that abstract. Um, but... If you, if you capture all these components, you will have a really good summary of what the paper is about. But you want to include a sentence which says this paper is about so that you can hone in on the most important thing. 
and then include the problem being researched and the author's purpose in writing, describe the methodology and key findings. You might be looking at across papers and noting different methodologies, so it's useful to put that in. What conclusions do the authors draw? That would also be really important to note. They might have said something in the literature review that you think is really useful, so then you can note that too. Perhaps there are some theoretical components that are of interest to your project, you could note that. And then any short quotes, um, which you would need to take verbatim with quotation marks and a page number. I think, you know, having a few really good quotes uh, in your notes is a really, um, is helpful when it comes to writing the paper overall. You don't want to have lots and lots of quotes. But a few, you know, select quotes are quite nice to put in there. So here's an example. Um, I gave you the reference for the example paper that I'm using, and now I'm going to summarize it. This paper is about the challenges of paraphrasing for graduate students in their writing. So there, in that first sentence, I've captured what this paper is about. That's the essence of it. Paraphrasing is defined as recontextualizing source information in one's own writing with a credit to the original author. So I, I think that definition in their words is much better than one I could say. So I've decided to keep the quote in quotation marks is exactly what was in the source text and it has the page number. Um, the authors argue that it is through paraphrasing that one can see how writers mediate source text and integrate not only others' voices but their own voices in their writing. So that's the argument being made in the paper and I've just captured that in one sentence. The purpose of the research is to explore the complexity of paraphrasing, even amongst advanced writers. The research has collected 192 paraphrases from 18 masters and PhD students in their academic phases. They also collected reflections on paraphrasing from these participants. So there's the methodology. It's just captured very simply. You know, if I wanted to write something more coherent about the methodology, I would have to go back to the paper. But I can see from this summary what it's about, and that's all I need. The purpose of the study was to show that paraphrasing is an instance of knowledge transformation as writers present their own interpretations and evaluations of the source text. So I think that is a, you know, a good quote to put in there, and I've just made a note of it. Their findings show that their participants' paraphrases ranged along a continuum from copying verbatim to restructuring the source text. So their findings are showing that paraphrasing is a lot more than we usually think about paraphrasing. And that's what I've tried to capture there. They conclude that paraphrasing is more than faithfully repeating the source text and that paraphrasing can be stamped with one's authorial intention and interwoven with one's opinion. They recommend that students be explicitly taught how to paraphrase. And to me, that's important and I can use that in my own arguments. Um, and then I've made a note, the researchers are Canadian-based academics, just in case I want to group these studies according to country of origin. So as we move on to the third component, I just want to um, make a point that you want to keep your summary separate from your interpretation. You don't want to in, in, inadvertently or unintentionally plagiarize. So keep the sections separate, put them in different colors um, or highlight them, use a different font, but you know, especially when you're working on a long project and you come back to it months later, you might have forgotten whether this was the summary or the interpretation. So the, th the third component is the interpretive or evaluative comments, and these are your thoughts, your take on the paper, your interpretation. And this is where you present a critical assessment of the research in the source text, but you also add in how you will use this in your review or your paper. So I've compiled a number of questions here. Obviously, you don't have to go through all of them every time. Some of them may be more relevant than others at certain, you know, for certain papers. So go through them and um, select the ones that you think would be helpful for you. You know, what type of source text is this? Is it peer-reviewed? What is the author's academic or intellect intellectual credentials? So if you're trying to promote an author's argument, if you can say this is a well-known author in the field, that would make that argument much stronger. So that's the point of having that in there. What evidence has the author provided for claims being made? Am I convinced by the argument being made and why? 
are there any shortcomings in this paper? This this all speaks to, you know, the critical element where you are critically engaging with this source text. Is the author making any assumptions? We often make, you know, big assumptions because we're all steeped in our own research worlds. Is the author positioned theoretically and is that relevant? That might not be relevant, but it might be. How is this research relevant to my study? What evidence can I use from this study? Will this study support my argument or provide a counter-argument? Can this text help me unpack the core arguments of my study? What is the significance of the source text for my own paper? What ideas related to my paper has the study generated? Are there any sources in the reference list relevant to my study? So the majority of those questions are about how and where you would use the source text in your own paper. So, you know, if, you, if you're going to use the source, source text to unpack your concepts, that would probably be in the beginning stages of your paper. Um, you want to note any ideas that come to mind as you go through your readings. Some of these might be really useful in helping you to generate your own conclusions. So keep, you know, keep a note of those. And then use your source text to build your body of knowledge about the literature. So if there are sources or references that you haven't come across before, but look, they look interesting, then make a note of that. You, you don't have to follow them up now, but you could follow them up later if necessary. So the previous questions are all about analysis and evaluation. They're interrogating the source text, you know, for its own internal consistency. Now, um, the next question that I've got up here, what connections can I make to other readings? This is a synthesis question. This is one of the most difficult things to do in a literature review is to see across the, um, the spectrum. And, um, and this is where an annotated bibliography can be incredibly useful because you can uh, look through your entries and see where papers are similar and then make notes. So in one entry you can say, well, this argument seems very similar to Jones 2019, you know, and then you can put the same point in, in the Jones uh, entry so that you're making these connections across the readings. Or you could say this argument is fundamentally different from the main thrust of the other arguments, and that would be a counter-argument that you're building in. It's really difficult to see these um, connections if you're only reading individual papers. But with an annotated bibliography, you can look across your summaries and come up with these conclusions. So here's my example of interpretive comments. Since my topic is about the connection between reading and writing, this paper will be very useful to explain the complexity involved. Student writers are always told to paraphrase and to reference the paraphrase and to avoid plagiarism. But this paper shows that paraphrasing is challenging no matter what level. Paraphrasing is not just about repeating the source text, it involves repurposing the source text. And writers can, can promote their argument through paraphrasing. So um, I've grouped these points here. They were These groupings weren't in the original article. But you can see how just by doing something like this, by just asking yourself, how can I use this paper? What's interesting from this paper? You can make these points that when you come to writing, already that thinking, that grouping has, has been done and you can transfer it into your writing. I like their definition and I may use it in my paper, but I'm not sure yet. I need to read more. I need to see how other people have defined this. And, you know, in reading others, I might be less convinced about this definition. But I've made a note for myself, so I know when I come back to this, that the definition was something that I could pull out. I can use this paper to provide evidence for my argument about the complexity of transferring reading into writing, and how reading can be transformed into new knowledge in writing. And then I made a note, this is a thorough study in a well-developed methodology and analytical process. So a critical assessment can result in a positive outcome. You can, you know, critically engage with the, the source text and come to the conclusion that it's been well done. And I've noted that here because this might be a paper that I come back to because it is so strong. 
so just some notes on writing the annotated bibliography. The citations need to appear in alphabetical order. As I've mentioned, the full citation is followed by the annotation. We format it in hanging indent. We start the annotation on a new line so that it's easy to see. We generally use the third person, not I. Um, but I want to add something to this. In the summary section, I would recommend not using I. But in the evaluative section, um, to me, it's much more helpful to use I. Now, in the summary section, you're going to take those summaries and put them into your paper. So not having the I is quite useful and it makes it easy to transfer. But I think when you're thinking critically, it's sometimes helpful to say to yourself, I think, uh, I wonder if, I'm not sure, but I'm thinking that maybe this is the case. And the annotated bibliography are notes really for yourself. When you translate those into your text, into your writing, you'll change that language and you'll, you know, you'll edit that quite a bit. But when you are beginning to think across source texts, sometimes it's just useful to have that comment. I think this is what ha what's happening. And then later on, you can come back and say, yes, I can definitely see that across the source text. And then use present tense, such as the authors suggest, the findings show. Now, when I suggest to my students that they need to do an annotated bibliography, um, I hear their unspoken question, why should I have to do this extra complicated, uh, this extra step that, step that is so complicated before writing? Why do I need to add all this work to my already heavy workload? Why can't I just read and write? And this is my argument. Uh, writing an annotated bibliography will help you in your writing. You might think that it would take up a lot more of your time and actually take longer in writing the whole paper. But, you know, in my experience, and I've seen this so often, the literature review is a really complicated paper and people tend to get stuck on it. Now, if you do an annotated bibliography, the chances are you won't get stuck on it. It's much easier to move from you know, these steps where you've thought out different things into compiling that writing into something that's coherent. So the annotated bibliography allows you that movement and, and you will have noted your thoughts down so that they are quite solid. In an annotated bibliography, you can also build in critical thinking. You know, if you go through, like, let's say, 10 sources and you do summaries and then you think, well, it's not really very critical. You can go back to each of those. And you can build on your notes. You can assess the papers in more detail and build in that critical thinking. It's very hard to do that if you've just read the paper and gone to your, your writing. Um, you can use the annotated bibliography to check the quality of your sources and whether the sources are relevant. So you might find you're reading a paper and as you're doing the notes, you're thinking, no, this, this one's not going to work in here and then you can leave it. Or um, as you've done the notes, you can identify these three papers are going to be absolutely crucial for me. So they really help you, they, they provide a stepping stone to helping you work out what you need to use in the paper. You'll be able to synthesize ideas, as I've been saying all the way through, by noting patterns across the annotations, which you can develop into themes or an argument. So let's say you have 25 annotations in your annotated bibliography. You can go through them with a highlighter and uh, work out themes in different colors. You might come up with three themes across the literature. You've got them all highlighted in different colors. You could work out your arguments and then provide evidence for your arguments in a different color across the literature as well. So this, this is synthesizing across the literature. It's really difficult to do that when you're reading individual papers and then writing straight into your document. So once you've done this kind of analysis and synthesis across your source text, you can then develop a plan and an outline for your literature review um, based on the themes and arguments you've identified. So once you have the outline, it's much easier to write the paper and to draw on your notes, you know, transfer from your notes into the paper using your outline as a guide to help you develop this coherent narrative. 
So what have we learned? The annotated bibliography has three components, a citation, a summary of the study, and an interpretive co component. It helps the writer transfer knowledge and information from source texts into their own writing. And it helps the writer synthesize content from the source texts. Um, it really helps to build in critical thinking and it helps you to organize and plan your writing. And it is particularly useful if you are working on a long-term project, you know, three months, six months, two years, four years. If you have these notes, you might come back to the original source, you might read it again, but then you can build on your notes and you already have lots of thoughts down there, uh, which you will find, I promise you, very useful at that point in time. So for something like a thesis or a research project, it's really helpful to have an annotated bibliography. Thanks for watching this video. Um, don't forget to look uh, out for my other videos on research writing, um, particularly on literature reviews. I'm producing new videos on literature reviews all the time, so watch out for those.